Kia ora and welcome to today's episode of the Disrupt Ed interviews. Today we have a slightly different perspective and we're speaking to a tertiary voice and um, I'm really pleased to introduce um, Giselle Burns who is the provost, I've just learned what that is sort of, um, at Massey University who's going to join us today and talk a little about their experience during the um, lockdown. Welcome Giselle, how are you? Kia ora Claire and thanks for inviting me to talk to you this afternoon. Do you, do you want to tell us first of all a little bit about your role that you have at Massey University? Yeah sure Claire, um, so as provost I'm responsible for leading the teaching and learning and the research and enterprise across the university and that is a, across all of our campuses and our uh, physical campuses as well as in our um, online mode and I work with a team of people across the university to ensure that we are delivering on what we say we're going to deliver and that we're doing the very best that we can for our staff and students. And, and so you've obviously had a really interesting few weeks at, in the Massey University context. We're obviously, um, for the most part, been talking to um, school educators and what their experience was like going into lockdown. Of course, this happened at a really interesting time for you as um, a tertiary provider in that many of your courses um, were, were just underway or not quite underway. What has the lockdown looked like for Massey University at this point of time? Yeah, so uh, Massey University has for uh, many, many years, uh, for many decades indeed, been um, a distance provider. Uh, and so we were fairly well positioned to really quickly switch onto an online mode. So fairly rapidly, uh, within the first 10 days or so, uh, more than 90% of our courses had been um, uh, converted into an online mode. Many of those courses already existed in a partial or a blended online uh, delivery mode. So we were fortunate in that we were able to pivot really quickly. Uh, the courses that we can't deliver online are those that require some face-to-face -face engagement, hands-on engagement, uh, block courses, etc. The rest of the sector, uh, in terms of the universities, has also been uh, rapidly uh, moving online. Although I have to say, I think that we've been at a bit of an advantage in that regard. We've um, been teaching uh, online. We've had uh, an opportunity to understand the pedagogy of teaching. Uh, it's not just a matter of turning on a camera. Uh, you know, you need to really think about your assessment. You need to think about the way you're structuring your learning experiences, the engagement of uh, students with the materials, etc. So we've got um, a lot of history to bring to the current moment. That has helped. Having said that, um, I think um, the speed with which we've had to pivot in the last two weeks has been phenomenal. And so our academic staff, our learning developers, our curriculum de designers have really just leaned into the effort and have done a magnificent job. So uh, we're, we're ready to roll next Monday when uh, the, our break resumes. Awesome. And so in terms of being um, long time, long distance providers of teaching and learning, well, what are some of the lessons that Massey University has, has learned over the years in terms of delivering really effective and engaging online teaching and learning? You, you mentioned it's not just a matter of switching on the cameras. I mean, if, if you had a bunch of secondary or primary educators sitting in front of you now, what, what would be the lessons that you'd share with them in terms of the biggest learnings and the biggest gains that you've had over the years? Mm. So I think in, in summary, they would be uh, student engagement. So keeping students uh, engaged with the learning journey, with the materials, and um, uh, and ensuring that they're really aware of what the milestones in their learning journey look like. Um, the availability of the, the teacher and the centrality of the teacher in that encounter. And I don't mean that this naturally means that it's a sort of teaching led experience, but I just mean the teacher is a point of contact. You know, we know that one of the real indicators um, in uh, predicting why students will withdraw from courses very early on is lack of engagement. So student yeah. engagement is absolutely number one. Um, and the role of the teacher is, is critical to that. The way a course is designed and the way that the content is consumed is critical. Um, many of our courses at Massey have been following a flipped classroom mode uh, for a long, long time. And so there's much more uh, emphasis when classes come together, either in person or virtually, on discussion, dialogue, exchange, and that kind of consumption of material 
um, often happens outside the formal learning uh, timetable and in the students' own times. Um, I think also there needs to be um, uh, engagement with, you know, really up-to-date resources. That's uh, that sort of a given. Um, uh, but we've got to be really cognizant of the way in which those resources are delivered. So we know now that, you know, just watching a 50 minute recording of a lecture just does not um, does not sustain interest. You know, students learn in bite sized chunks and they they like pieces of, of exciting information to keep them going. So I think um, it's put a lot of onus on the teacher to ensure that they are actively engaging students, that they're actively thinking from the student's perspective as to what the, the learning experience is about. Um, and to be also, as teachers, reflecting on their own learning practice so that they're really quite um, uh, clear in narrating what their own pedagogical approach is and then how, how they are designing assessment to support that, etc. Yeah, I, I had a couple of light bulb moments, actually, when you were talking there, where I realised that there was things that I enjoyed in my own tertiary distance learning that I haven't necessarily translated to the school space. And um, a couple of those things were, one thing that was really powerful when you started taking a paper is to have the timeline of the study and um, what you're expected to do really clearly mapped out for you um, in terms of some flags and you know when different little chunk sizes. Because often as teachers, we hold a lot of that information in our head and we're very responsive to the students sitting in front of us. And sometimes that can be at the expense of upfronting all of the little sort of flags and the timelines and the milestones of the study. Do you find that's a really important part of um, students maintaining engagement is understanding how the learning is going to look over a period of time? Oh, absolutely. I think making the the knowledge or the information that we assume to be implicit, making that explicit, I think is absolutely vital because you're quite right. There's a lot of assumed knowledge that happens even yeah. within a within a classroom where there are physical bodies meeting. So you do have to make that really, really super clear. And in addition to that, you know, the old style of teaching, and I'm going to say now uh, pre-COVID, not just, you know, <laughs> late 19th, early 20th mm -hmm. century, teaching, the sage on the stage model, um, you know, when I, when I was an undergraduate and went to university, the lecturer would literally be at the lectern and would be um, delivering information from, from notes or from a PowerPoint that as students we couldn't see. Mm. You know? but, but when you're teaching online, it's like everything's exposed, you know, and, and when you're putting your learning materials up online, um, it's there for scrutiny, like, and sometimes public scrutiny. So, so you've got to be really clear about what you're saying. Um, and there's also a level of exposure there, I think, for for teachers, which which um, brings, I think, super transparency, which I think can only be a good thing for a student. Yeah, yeah, and I think it it, it also um, highlights the importance of I think those timelines and structures and like the paper outline that you get at university is very good at highlighting what the exact threshold concepts and skills are that you're expected to engage with and learn over the period of um, studying a paper. And I think that's really important for our educators to make sure it's not just about deadlines, it's not just about assessments, that they're really calculating um, the learning objectives and the, the threshold concepts and skills as well. And do you think that's something that university in um, sort of online spaces has learned to do better maybe over time? Oh, I think through our learning management system, so that's the platform through which we deliver, um, all of those parameters are absolutely explicit and clear. So the des description of a course, the learning outcomes, the journey that you will um, undergo, um, the assessment um, types and, uh, you know, when they are due, et cetera, what you're expected right up front uh, is sh is shared with the student. And I think that's um, I think that's important on for two reasons. One, I think, you know, students embarking on that journey, and particularly if they never actually meet other students or their teacher in person, need to have that really clear. But I also think that progressively, and, and especially in the last 25 to 30 years, um, when students have been paying more for their education, they, they want to see all that up front. They don't just take it yeah. on tr trust and on faith. You know, they want to know that because they are, they're consumers in a way. We don't like talking about students as consumers, but, you know, that, that in a sense, they very much are in that we are producing a product together, but we are delivering a service to them.
Yeah, and one, and, and one thing that really struck me when you were talking earlier as well is talking about discussion online. I think often in a school context, and this might just be exposing the narrowness of, of my thinking at this point in time, but I, I think I suspect we default back to a couple of different modes. We default back to, at the moment, um, Google Meetings as a way of having face-to-face -face, um, either direct instruction or talking within a group in, 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 in a verbal way, um, or we then um, set up tasks and activities that are quite inquiry-based and self-directed for the student to engage with in an asynchronous manner uh, when and um, if they they want to. The bit that I suspect we're missing sometimes, which I, I remember now being a really enjoyable part of my online tertiary study, was the very carefully constructed written discussions we were asked to be engaged with. And has that always been an important part of tertiary study and, and distance learning online? Because I, I wonder if it's a strategy we might forget in our online, like we default so quickly now to Google Meetings and doing stuff verbally that maybe we're forgetting those strategies and those tools around the written debate and discussion within your learning platform as well. Yes, I think that's a very good observation. There is something absolutely in between there. And and a key part of an online learning experience is the ability to access those you know, online tutorials, um, online chat groups where, where, where comments are written. So there is actually... Yeah. You can go back as a student and, and look for that question that you posted and what was the discussion around that. Um, but it also relies on having a really good moderator in the role of the course coordinator or the teacher who will actually construct the, the questions and moderate the discussion somewhat. Uh, sometimes, you know, there's a tendency online for people to kind of forget who they are or forget that their name is associated you know, with, their, with their online online identity um so you know i think i think by and large um those those online discussions are incredibly valuable i mean um i've been at massey for uh, this is my fifth year and the first year i was here at massey i i decided to um just to understand a bit more about the way the university um uh, delivered its teaching i um what enrolled or audited of course so I didn't formally enroll but I was um, effectively a student in an online iteration of a big first year course and that gave me access to the um, as a student to the online chat rooms etc and um, it was incredibly um, instructive and really humbling too mm. to see the work and the energy and the questions and the you know the, the the courage that a lot of students a lot of mature learners were enrolled in this course and they were coming back to study and asking questions perhaps online that they wouldn't have asked in yeah. the face-to-face -face classroom and um the rest of the student body were incredibly generous and giving and it was just it was a community all of its own and i've seen that in other fora as well online where it can be incredibly nurturing and supportive so i do really think that that's a that's a real asset and that's yeah. a real bonus of, of online. And we tend to overlook and forget that because we do focus just on the synchronous or, as you say, the kind of, you know, the other, other end of the spectrum in terms of, you know, go and do your assignment or do that reading outside class. And I think there are sort of gradations uh, along that uh, spectrum. And and what and you you mentioned earlier this idea of being really reflective as a teacher and learner in an on, online space, um, you know, and 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 in high school teacher speak we often talk about the idea of teaching as inquiry or the inquiries that we might undertake to look at our teaching and learning practice i mean obviously when you've been doing a lot of online teaching and learning you've got a whole lot of data at your fingertips that goes beyond you know observation and those sorts of things what does it look like for um a a lecturer as an inquirer i guess <laughs> <laughs> or a you know a facilitator as an inquirer or how do you support your your people delivering um the teaching and learning to reflect and to um to measure the effectiveness of their practice in this online space yeah that's a really good question because of course at universities all of our academics are expected to be active researchers as well as uh, active teachers and so uh, most academics feel that 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 pull of both of those parts of their beings and that's a really good thing because that's what defines universities and teaching is research informed um so on the teaching side of the house absolutely we encourage self-reflection we encourage um uh, our teachers to uh think um a, 
really hard about their curriculum design, about their assessment design. We've got active um, learning and teaching circles, that discussion circles, uh, professional development programs that we wrap around uh, our staff to allow them to think about that in a structured way. Yep. Um, to, to allow them, if they want to seek a, a higher education um, accreditation for that, they can uh, develop a teaching portfolio, and that's sort of more formal. So it's sort of there's a spectrum there of, of informal uh, reflection right through to the more formal. Uh, and certainly at Massey, in our academic promotions and rewards process, we, we do absolutely reward that kind of reflective critical thinking and how that can be manifest and demonstrated. And we're lucky to have at Massey a number of award-winning teachers who've won uh, Prime Minister's Prizes for tertiary teaching excellence because exactly, you know, they've, they've been part of um, kind of really um, leading the thinking around um, a, a particular part of pedagogical practice. So so we actively, um, we give time to staff to do that, but it's probably fair to say that that's always a, a bit of a tug for academic staff given the research um, that they have underway. Yeah. And, and the need to think about both of those in, in tandem. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 an, it's an ongoing piece of work and it's very, very important for academic staff. So how do you define excellence in delivering online teaching? Hmm, it's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> so, you didn't uh, know this was a quiz, so, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So look, we, um, look a, range of, a range of metrics. So it's um, student voice is important uh, in terms of student evaluations, et cetera, and, um, and uh, the process of uh, continuous feedback and how our teaching staff are taking on board student voice. Um, peer assessment and peer review of how teaching is practiced in the, in the classroom. Uh, Self-reflection and um, assessment through a formal portfolio. Um, and, and their submission of that through an accrediting process or through a, um, uh, a process through Aqua Aotearoa, for instance, um, for, um, for um, kind of benchmarking yeah. is important. Um, and I think, you know, the ways in which we encourage our staff to engage with the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, and here at Massey, I'll get a plug in for Massey here. Um, we've, we've been doing quite a lot of work around SOTL in recent years, and you can, in fact, um, as a research active academic, be promoted to professor on the basis of your SOTL scholarship of teaching and learning. So um, that's, that sends a really powerful message to the way in which we value uh, teaching excellence right through the institution. What's that acronym stand for? <laughs> the scholarship of teaching and learning. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. I, just, I never like to presume anyone knows an acronym. <laughs> Because I didn't. Okay, so that take, that takes me to that. I, you mentioned as well that idea of being an auditor on a course. So does that mean that you're um, that you have people on management who enrol themselves into those online courses? And are no. they? Yeah, no, no, no. That's not a regular thing that happens no. at all. No, no. So no. you're not watching like Big Brother at all times. No, <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, I remember, you know, in, in the days um, 25, 30 years ago when I was an undergraduate, it was quite common for members of the public to be able to audit a university course. And it was it was kind of pre-U3A, University of the Third Age, and you'd often get people who wanted to consume the content and engage, but they weren't interested in doing the assessments and getting a credit. Uh, and for various reasons, um, that no longer happens. Uh, mainly to do with funding um, but uh, no short answer as a yeah. matter of practice no but no, I think it's didn't. a res but I do think it's a responsibility if you come into um, an organization you've got a responsibility to understand uh, what happens yeah. and and to familiarize yourself with um, with the organization mm. so look I wasn't I wasn't spying on oh, no, everything that's that happened in that course <laughs> checking yeah <laughs> And I guess um, the other thing that I know that um, a lot of our, without a lot of our viewers being in the secondary school space, I know a question that's burning for them at the moment is what's going to happen. And I know you're not in a position to say what's going to happen with NCA or officially what's going to happen with um, university entrance in 2020, with it being such a disrupted um, year. But what's what's your perception in terms of how responsive universities can be um, to a time like this? Because I recognise that you know you're, you're commercial entities really in the sense that you need to get students 
um, you know, you want students um, coming into the university and you want them to succeed. So can you talk to us a little bit about the capacities for universities to be responsive um, in, in a period of such uncertainty in terms of students getting into university and, and, and succeeding in their pathway through from school into the tertiary space? Yes, yes, I can. I mean, there's often an assumption that universities are these big lumbering dinosaurs that, you know, uh, that can't move in a very agile manner. In fact, I think the last two to three weeks has shown the complete opposite. We, we have all eight universities in this country have done a complete sort of pivot in the interest of continuity of learning for students. And I think that is just absolutely magnificent, frankly. Yeah. Uh, so we do have the ability to be agile. Um, I can't tell you now what those um, changes might be or the way in which we might um, manage admissions going forward, but I can tell you that we'll work with the sector and we'll work with the ministry to ensure that whatever we do is, in the, is, is has minimal disruption for students and is in the best interest of students. And I think that's what we've got to do. I think there are many things at the moment that are showing us that the old world will, will, um, will not go back to what we knew before. We are going into a new world post-COVID. One of those things is that we've got to um, connect up and hold hands across the compulsory sector and the higher education tertiary sector. Yeah, uh, we, we already look uh, in our sector at a number of the things that in the secondary school sector, you do incredibly well. Online assessment is one of them, for instance. We've been doing that uh, in a kind of patchwork way in the university sector for some time. Um, but in that regard, we're looking, uh, we're looking to you to learn something from, from you. I think also that the um, there's a lot of um, connectivity between the various disciplinary clusters at um, secondary school and at uh, university that you know we, we could uh, bridge, bridge a little bit more strongly in terms of understanding how we are supporting students going forward. Um, so I think there's a lot we can learn from each other actually, but we'll do our very best to support students because yeah. uh, that's 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 our business, and students will become. I mean, they are absolutely at centre of what we do at the moment, but they will become much, much more important. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So people can rest assured that yep, it, it's not exactly transparent and clear what you know is the plan for twenty twenty, but they can rest assured that the universities are going to be looking to meet the students and the schools and you know the situation where it's at. You know, rather than trying to uphold any artificial um, sort of barriers or goalposts that are, that oh, are gonna, oh, you know it, it, look absolutely because I think you know as you intimated um the universities will want to continue to have that pipeline coming through uh, particularly from the school lever demographic um we already know that with the international student market um that there is going to be a market that will uh, if it hasn't um, kind of stalled at the minute, then it is likely to for the foreseeable future. So, of course, uh, we want to ensure that uh, we have a healthy domestic market. And a school lever market is a big part of that. Um, at Massey University, a school lever market um, provides, you know, over half of our student cohort. And in some areas, like your own in, in Albany and North Auckland, um, the majority of students are coming from from a school leader background. So we're very, very sensitive to the kind of uh, changes that might be afoot and we will be um, in close and constant communication with uh, with the ministry and and I hope with the school sector and our partner schools in our in our areas where all of our campuses are reside to ensure that we minimize disruption. Yeah, and I, I know um, from personal experience with Albany Senior High School being a, a school mm. that's um, obviously invested in the concept of project-based learning and impact projects. And, and whilst um, they haven't necessarily been recognised within the NCA framework, I do know that schools that are doing stuff a bit differently and are doing some of that project-based service learning, you know, extended project type work, that work is already being recognised for you know, by universities in different ways as well. And I think it, it can often be good for people to have that sort of sense of, a, a sort of assurance that it's not necessarily as black and white as we think it is in terms of just being about, you know, the grade point average and NCA and those sort of things, that there's a whole lot of things that we do in schools, um, you know, whether it be their extracurricular or project-based learning, that um, brings real value to um, what the students have to offer tertiary providers as well. And, and I know we've seen firsthand how often that um, 
enhances our students' chance of getting things like scholarships as well for university. Yep, yep, yep. And absolutely, I can tell you that at Massey, we take a, a holistic view to, mm. to looking at um, students' achievements. Um, yes, uh, you know, the GPA matters, but so do, do a whole range of other skills that are vital for life. Uh, you know, le leadership being one of them, um, creative thinking. Um, you know, in fact, you know, we really place a premium on um, on skills and the kind of skill that we are likely to see develop going forward again in the post-COVID world are going to be those skills of creativity, of leadership, of critical thinking and of entrepreneurial behaviour and enterprise thinking. So it's, it's those kind of skills and that package that, um, absolutely are going to characterise the university student uh, of the, you know, the, the post-COVID 21st century world, uh, because that's what we're going to need, right? You know, yeah. we're, we're entering into a world that is going to be volatile, uncertain, and we don't know what it's going to be look like. I mean, we've been saying to our students for a number of, of years, and you will have too, that, you know, the fourth industrial revolution is, a, a, you know, upon us in the near future. It's here now. Yeah, yeah we're living it, aren't we? And if you know, we we need creative problem solvers, <laughs> and we, we do more and more. <laughs> we do well. You know, to that point, we've got a real focus at Massey through our research and our teaching on on encouraging students to solve wicked problems, and these yeah. are big, intractable issues, societal issues in the main. We're we're living through one at the moment. So, you know, that's the kind of real world engagement and experience that we want and expect students to be engaging with. So, you know, absolutely, you know, I think, you know, we will work with the school sector to ensure that, that you know, there's a holistic kind of assessment that, that occurs. And certainly we, we're committed to that at Massey and things like scholarships, um, because, you know, we, we want to win win at the end of the day. Fantastic. Okay, so on our closing note, have you got just a little, any couple of tips and takeaways that you'd like to leave um, our educators with in terms of preparing for the weeks ahead? Oh, I'd like to say um, keep calm and carry on, but you know, I would just say, um, you know, well done and thank you. And, you, you, you know, um, Making the transition to pivot and to teach online, and I, I still have one daughter who's who's at school, and and uh, so she starts back again tomorrow. Uh, I really um, have huge admiration for the organisation, uh, the the kind of can do attitude and the tenacity uh, that uh, that I think you and your colleagues are demonstrating in terms of pivoting so quickly. And um, so I just say thank you, actually. Awesome. Thank you, Giselle. That's perfect. So um, just in closing, everyone watching this, thank you for joining us today and make sure that you head over to YouTube and find the Disrupt Ed TV channel and make sure you subscribe so you can have an interview landing in your inbox every, um, every day. So thank you again, Giselle. That was absolutely fantastic.